Welcome to Conversations. I'm John Bradshaw, and my guest today, special guest, is Hendel Butoy, who is a professor of animation at Southern Adventist University. In the past, he has worked for the Disney Company as an animator in Burbank, California. And the story of his life is a story of God's leading. It's an exciting story, and you'll be blessed as we explore it here today. Hendel, thanks for joining me today. I appreciate it greatly. You're welcome. Thank you. Butoy. Now, I know this about you. You were, you were raised in Brazil, but I also know enough about names to know that Butoy is not a very Portuguese sounding name. So let's start at the beginning. Before we talk about your work at Disney, before we talk about your work with animation and teaching students in, a, in an academic setting and teaching animation, let's go back and catch up a little bit about your life story. So where did the name come from? Butoy is a Romanian name. My father was born in Romania, and, uh, but I also have a Hungarian name. My middle name is uh, Segedi, which is Hungarian. And so my mother's uh, on the Romanian side. Okay. So somehow a Romanian and a Hungarian, either together or independently of each other, went from what at the time had to have been, was it communist Europe? Uh, it Close to it. Early 50s. Yeah. Early mid 50s. So from there to... Brazil, it sounds like there's a story involved in that. So, so tell me more about that. Well, my father was a refugee from Romania during the communist takeover. He wasn't part of the party, and so he couldn't get an education or anything like that. And, and he, was, uh, he was an Adventist Christian and um, felt that he would have a better chance outside of the country at that time. So he was drafted into their army, um, and during the training, he had prayed to God that they would station him on the border where he might have a chance. And uh, uh, it happened just as he prayed. And, really? and they had like a nine day journey through Yugoslavia to finally get to Italy where they were chased by soldiers. They were captured once and escaped again, but finally got to Italy where they claimed political asylum. And from there, they uh, had several choices of where to go. Um, and they chose Brazil because uh, they could have come to the United States, but the United States was in a war, and they were telling them that if they went there, they'd have to be um, served in the U.S. Army first, before they, but then become automatic citizens. But my father thought, I just came out of the Army, I just came out of a, a bad situation. In Brazil, there's nothing going on there with armies and wars, so I'll go there. So very clearly, we're gonna hear a lot more about God's leading in your life. God was leading in your life before your life had begun. Yeah, very much so. Did your father used to talk about that story much? Did he tell you much? Did he talk about the details? Or was it one of those memories that, that sometimes these guys are pushing away into the background? He would talk about it many times because he felt that God had led him. And uh, it was always uh, reassuring to his own faith in God as he would retell that story to friends and family and others and to us. Um, I videotaped him telling that story and um, because I wanted to keep it and also pass it on as well, so. That's a story that even your children would love to hear. Yeah. So, so a, a Romanian flees. Uh, it's an exciting journey, a, ha a hazardous journey, obviously. Now, now a, a Romanian who, who's come out of a, an uprising situation uh, in Europe finds himself in Brazil. I mean, so what, what, what's, how did he acclimate or get used to being in Brazil? Was that a, a radical adjustment or did God simply open doors and it was plain sailing? The, the way that he talked about it is that Ro Romania is a Latin-based language and so is Portuguese. So the transition wasn't that difficult because of that. Um, but he started going to school and then ended up being a coal porter for five or six years. And in the process, met my mother who was uh, close to one of the colleges down there in Southern Brazil, Sao Paulo. And uh, they met and got married. Your, your parents were, came from Europe to Brazil, then to the United States. So what happened there? My mother had a sister in the United States already and, and uh, she was being invited to come up and our, our family, my parents thought it would be best for us. And so they went through the process and were able to get the papers to 
uh, to come up this way. We traveled by ship. Uh, it was like a one, ma- a one month trip from Brazil up through the Panama Canal and then ended, ended up in San Pedro, California. But what was it like for you, maybe you don't remember, maybe you do, starting life again, going to a whole new country, coming to a culture that you weren't familiar with, perhaps you're gonna to have to learn a language that you didn't know? Actually, I didn't think about those things at the age of four. I just knew I was with my parents and we were going somewhere. And um, when we arrived, we, uh, uh, we stayed with one of my mother's sisters for, for a little while. And then I started going to school. Um, and I do remember uh, going into school and not knowing how to speak English and needing to use the restroom and using the wrong restroom <laughs> and being told that. And, uh, but uh, we picked up the language very quickly as kids do and uh, ended up speaking English back to my parents who would speak to us in Portuguese. And so there was this uh, uh, cultural language uh, thing that was going on when we were younger. Uh, and, and I would hear my father speak Romanian. And I would hear my mother speak Hungarian. So I grew up with all kinds of languages going on in the home, although English was the one that I picked up and, and stuck with because that's what we were using at school. Okay, so it's not everybody, particularly in those days, but back then when, when you're getting, when you're looking at going to school, we're talking in the 70s? Yeah, 60s or 70s. Okay, right around that time, uh, animation schools weren't a dime a dozen. Today, it, it's not hard to find an animation program back then. So, so something was going on in your mind that, that caused you to lean towards animation. What, t- tell me about that. I always enjoyed drawings and I was drawn to pictures. Um, uh, my parents got us, got us kids, there were four of us in the family, and um, uh, they, they got us the Arthur Maxwell Bible story books, the whole volume. And I remember getting those books and being very intrigued by the pictures, not so much the words because I couldn't read English that well. Um, and so I would sit and look at the pictures a lot. And, my dad was a great storyteller. I mean, he loved to tell the story of his, his own adventure, but he also loved to tell Bible stories. So he would sit uh, with us next to the bed and he'd act out the stories, you know, Stam- Samson or David and Goliath and all. And so my dad brought it to life. What I was seeing in those pictures, he would bring to life in the way that he would tell the stories for us. And so I enjoyed that. And I enjoyed looking at, at the pictures and then with television, we saw something else on television, which was animation. There were cartoons, there were short cartoons, but sometimes there were these longer animated pieces that had more intricate stories than the slapstick stuff. And when I saw one of those, I was intrigued that I, I was brought into a, another world. I knew it wasn't a real world, but felt believable. And I was intrigued by the fact that these were drawings and yet they were moving and I felt like they were real. And I can articulate it better today, but I think what was going on in my mind then is I saw a powerful medium with this ability to draw me in, and I knew it was drawing other people in to tell them stories. And at the same time, I saw a powerful message in the pictures that I was seeing in those books and my father's stories that he would tell us. And I was thinking, a powerful medium and a powerful message. What happens if you combine the two, what would happen? And that intrigued me, I think, kept me going and wanting to know more about this medium and how to learn it. So at an early age, I wanted to be an animator. All these years later, you're a man of faith. God is still very important in your life, yeah, particularly close to God. Let's step out of the, the, the education and the animating for a minute. Tell me about what was going on in your home as your parents invested in you spiritually. What was your home like spiritually? What was your spiritual upbringing like? We had regular uh, family worships in the mornings and in the evenings, uh, especially Fridays was a very special time that we would always, my father was very um, 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 consistent in welcoming the Sabbath. And, uh, and so that, that was always there. Um, he would encourage us to read the Bible. All these were from, because of his own experiences, and he saw how God had led him, that he wanted to impress his children that God was real, and that you can trust him, and that you can put your, your life in his hands, and he'll, he'll lead you um, to, to be an influence for him to others. And so, um, on, on Sabbaths, it, it was um, 
typical for us for, to, to go out somewhere as a family and just be together as a family. And so we were close because of that. And I, I think that all that continued to um, just impress me in the message that he would constantly talk about and how we can trust God. We can, uh, we can believe in the things that he has to say in his word. So here you are from a strong Christian home and you, you had this fascination with animation. Were you naturally an artistic kid, good at drawing and, 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 and sort of felt led or drawn into artsy things? I, I knew that I liked to draw. I never thought myself as being very good at it, um, but I enjoyed it. And um, uh, so, yeah, I was always looking at drawing things and, and copying things that I, that I saw. Um, but I never had any other training beyond that, although one day I did uh, draw something in an advertisement which says, you know, you draw this and we might give you a, a free lesson or something. And uh, a salesman shows up at our, our door one day who wants to sell uh, my parents that, uh, on a correspondence art course in Chicago, and they make the claim, well, Disney took a course from us way back, you know, in the 1920s or something, that's their claim to fame. Um, but what I was surprised about is that they asked me, would you like to do this? And I, I said, yeah, actually I would. And it wasn't, it wasn't, uh, uh, it wasn't cheap. Um, my father, having come from a third, third world country, didn't have a full education, and he was always able to make ends meet. Um, but they weren't financially, you know, well off, but they still went ahead and uh, allowed me to take this course. And so this encouraged me down the path of developing my skills. So spiritual home, Christian home, um, but you don't want to become a doctor. You, you're not being drawn to be a nurse. You haven't said anything about wanting to be a preacher. Um, what else might you've been? You, you, you may or may not have wanted to go into business, but that wasn't the leaning. All of those would have been pretty normal. If you told your parents, I'm thinking of going into the ministry, they would have said, well, yeah, that's, that's, I'm sure they'd have said it's great and they wouldn't have been surprised. It's a pretty typical and traditional route. But you at some stage tell your parents, I imagine, that you want to go down a, a very non-traditional route and, and actually pursue animation. How did your parents react to that? They were supportive. Um, I think that my father would have liked me to have tried something else, um, but was still, uh, still felt that if he supported me in something, as long as I was following the Lord in every step, that the Lord would have a mission or a reason for it. Um, otherwise, he would not have let me go down that route. Um, uh, he, he would occasionally sit down and talk to me and just ask me, you know, what, what's your future plan? What, you know, what do you plan to do? But it would always end with, make sure you make God first on whatever you choose to do. Well, your story is, is, is fascinating because God's leading is clear. Today, you're leading young people and you're, you're, you're pouring yourself into their professional and personal growth. And all the way along, since before you were born, God was clearly leading you. So we're going to talk a little bit more about God's leading in the life and ministry of Hendel Butoy on Conversations in just a moment. More and more people are watching It Is Written TV. They're watching their favorite It Is Written programs, listening to inspiring sermon series, and much more. They're watching them here, here, and even here. See for yourself why people are turning to It Is Written TV to watch their favorite Christian programs live and on demand. Watch It Is Written TV for free anytime on Roku, Apple TV, and at itiswritten.tv. This is Pearl. When Pearl heard about the Eyes for India initiative, she decided she was going to take matters into her own hands. When Pearl's birthday came around, she invited all of her friends over for a birthday party and the theme of the party was Eyes for India. She told her friends about the thousands of people in India who couldn't see and how this critical eye surgery could change their lives. Instead of gifts, Pearl asked that her friends bring donations for this important project. Because of Pearl's influence, seven people are now able to see. Her story inspired our brand new mission kit. It's a box that has everything you need 
to fundraise your own project for Eyes for India. Whether it's at the front desk of your business, part of your small group, or a special church project, this kit is guaranteed to change lives. We can't wait to hear about all the creative ways you find to make this resource come to life, just like Pearl. Welcome back to Conversations, where my guest today is Hendel Butoy, who is a professor of animation at Southern Adventist University. He's leading young lives today and preparing people for lives of service. God led his life. And down an unorthodox route, when you look back, do you feel like it was unorthodox, unusual, or to you was it just as normal as anything to be led into a, a career as an animator, particularly in the e era when you were coming up? Um, I heard that it was unorthodox, but I never felt it because I, I had great support from my parents. So you, you tell your parents one day, you know, it's, it's not a lawyer I want to be, it's not a doctor, I don't want to open a business, I want to draw pictures. And uh, you mentioned a moment ago, your dad was the sort of man who said, as long as God is leading, our support is there. Kids everywhere have aspirations, and I would say, and I think you'd agree that many people would say unattainable. It's a rarefied field that not everybody who feels like they want to get into, gets into. How do you get into animation? I just took the steps uh, to get there, but um, always feeling that if this wasn't going to be for me, there'd be a door shut and then I'd go somewhere else. But as long as the doors kept opening, I would c uh, continue to walk through. So um, I, I began to dabble with it a little bit. My father had a Super 8 movie camera and I was playing with that. They, uh, Although in those days you had to ship the film out and wait a few days to come back before sure. you could ever see what you did. But I played with that and then did a little uh, film with it and showed it at a art festival in uh, Loma Linda one day. And there was a, another student there who saw it, who was going to, uh, who was a student at um, California Institute of the Arts and told me about that and said, hey, would you like to do this for a living? Because they're training people actually to do this. And I said, really, I never, heard of a place with actually training people because no school actually was doing it at that time. But actually this one was. California's to the Arts was started by Walt Disney after he passed away. He had it in his will that he wanted to start this school that would um, uh, bring st uh, uh, creative students to, uh, to work with each other. And, and one of the programs at the school was animation. And it was being taught by Disney veterans who were, uh, were there realizing that they were moving on and they hadn't trained a younger generation yet to come up for, um, uh, with them. And so they had started this program. And the time that I entered that program was its third year. So it was fresh, brand new. And in fact, the students that came were there before me, the first and second year, and then several years after, uh, many of us who went through that, today they're the leading artists in, in the animation industry today. Uh, so we were all in school together during that time and uh, we're learning from each other as well as from these Disney veterans who were there. Was it difficult? It was, it was difficult kind of like um, um, searching for firewood in a campfire. You got to go out and do it and cut it and go through the struggle, but you love every min minute of it. It's like the pleasure is there as well as the, uh, the struggle. It seems to me this, has to, this would take an inordinate amount or an enormous amount of patience to be an animator back when ev everything was hand-drawn at the time, right? Just doing things over and over and over until you got it. And uh, actually that never changes. <laughs> it's, that's still the way it's done. It's just that you learn that that's the process and you, um, uh, you acclimate with that and you just go through the, the process of, of struggling to get things right. So when you were studying animation, what was the animation scene like? You would say, well, the, the, the leading lights or the big productions, what was the talk of animation at the time? At the time when I entered animation, um, it was sort of a low point in the industry um, because Walt Disney had passed away a decade and a half earlier. And so the studio had no real guiding vision and they were sort of living in the past and trying to do things uh, of the past. Um, and so the, uh, the, the, uh, that time was one where it was sort of a rebuilding time. And a lot of the animators were young. 
just fresh and green and just getting started um, because, as I said, the, the, the original veterans of animators had moved on. And I think when I actually got to Disney, there were only like two or three of them left. And um, uh, I was fortunate to actually be mentored by one of them, but they weren't there for very long. So it, it was like a new generation trying to find themselves and discover things and learn it as, as they went. Um, there came a point where um, Disney almost shut down animation. I was going to ask you, at the, at the time, what was the sense of the future for animation? When you got in there and, you okay, you had a job doing what you love, but what was the idea of where are we going to be five years from now or what's on the horizon? What was that sense like? For the artists, it was, well, we never know if we're going to have uh, a job after this production. Who knows you know, what's going to happen? But eventually what happened is uh, Roy Disney, who was the nephew of Walt Disney, was part of the board. And he actually is the one who got things started. He, he found some, there was going to be a takeover of the company by, I think, a hostile investor. And uh, Roy was able to get these other, they call them White Knights investor, to come in and buy the company. And with that, he brought in a new uh, regime of executives who saw that animation was the crown jewel, as he put it. This is the crown jewel of this company. We can't let this go. Otherwise, if we do that, we're going to let the whole company go. And they began to shake things up and uh, began to actually put a lot of the younger people, uh, the animators there, actually put, put them in positions of, of um, leadership to actually begin to direct or come up with story ideas and such. And that began to, began to turn things, things around. So when you got in there, I want you to tell me what it was like for a kid to walk into Disney, a, a young person, to walk into Disney, and it sounds like this is your first job out of college, and my goodness, I'm working at the venerable Disney. How's that? It's both intimidating and exciting at the same time, because you, were, you would walk through the halls and see the pictures and see the drawings that they had done, we always had access to what the artists had done in the past. We could go down to a room that they called the morgue, where they would keep all the old drawings, and we could uh, pull those out, look at them, study them, draw from them, um, and, and learn from that. So that was the exciting part, is that you had all this wealth of, of knowledge and of, of past artwork that was always around you. Um, it was overwhelming in that there was ex expectations that you would be doing the same kind of things that they had been doing. And um, I remember thinking as, when I first arrived there, I thought, I, I don't know how long I'm gonna last here before they finally discover I can't really draw, <laughs> you know? Or I can't draw as well as they can. But then I find out other artists like me, young artists are thinking the same thing. And then we find out that a lot of the Disney veterans when they first arrived, that's the way they felt and the way they, they, that they uh, um, had experienced things. And so, what we discovered is that we actually, we learn from each other as we look at each other's work, critique it, remind ourselves of the, of the principles of making this thing work, and, and, um, and we just do it. Just the pleasure of sitting down, drawing, making something come to life, um, there, was, uh, there was joy in that. Tell me about the, the environment. So you're working at Disney. What's it like? What are the people like? What are the attitudes like? What's the guiding principle? When you get inside and you look around and you take the temperature, what is it that you find the company's actually like from the inside? They're all people wanting to do something that's fun and entertaining. And uh, we talk about it. We have story meetings where we would uh, discuss ideas. Um, there, many times there'd be a script that we be, would begin with, but then we'd veer off the script because as you begin to draw, other ideas come. Which I find interesting that the animators actually had input into the script and affected what the story ultimately looked like. All the time, uh, the script was never the final thing. Uh, they'd work on a script to get us started, but then when you begin to draw, uh, other ideas begin to come to your mind and, you, and the story starts veering different directions. Um, and then, uh, uh, and then there's also the, uh, the designing of the characters, what the character is going to look out like and searching for that and what, what, what makes a character appealing. And so there's a lot of, uh, uh, there's a lot of back and forth and looking at, at each other's work and, and uh, comparing things for what had been done in the past and trying to measure up to that. Um, 
all that I think was part of the, the growing process for us as artists. And so you were able to have your, your own material input on, onto the way a story may, may develop or grow or this aspect of the story. Yeah, they, they, they would encourage when there was a production that was being worked on and there was a test screening or a, pro, a process of screening in, in process and they would show the, the department, they would always encourage us to give feedback to the directors or to the art directors and such in order to um, improve and to strengthen the stories. So it was very much a collaborative effort from the ground up. Animation has to be, it's, it has many layers, many levels to it in order to be um, uh, a well-crafted piece. And so, yeah, we all had input, not only on the things we drew, but also on ideas and, uh, and on uh, the quality of things. I want to ask you about this. There are some people, and I don't think it's everybody, but there are some people who will see Disney as problematic. Uh, a great big evil empire corrupting the, the minds and morals of, of people everywhere. Uh, but you worked there. So explain what you saw as opposed to what other people may surmise or suppose. What I saw was uh, artists who loved their work and wanted to tell stories. But they were not always converted Christian people and they had world views, uh, and they had views of ways of making things entertaining, and that's the process that they would go by. They, they would try to make those in order to be pleasing to the audience. And uh, as a Christian, uh, what I had the opportunity of was that I would sit in meetings like that, and if something came up where it bothered me, I could say it, and nobody would uh, nobody would mind. Everything that was said was always welcomed in terms of ideas and such because they felt that it would be uh, um, strengthening the, the stories. And there were times where I would say something to go, oh yeah, you know, right, we shouldn't, maybe we shouldn't put this in there. We shouldn't do this this, this way or that way. And so there is a place there for, for the Christian whose God can work or speak through them to remind people of things that people actually already know in the back of their heads that, or they forget, or they're just not aware of and can be brought up to the front in terms of um, how to say things or how to portray things. Let's talk about that for a moment. Again, I'll, I'll repeat this. I've already repeated it. I'll repeat it again. Uh, the way God has led you and your family, dramatic really, not, not too many families have a story that your family has. God led you, he, put you in, a, in the cocoon, I said, in the most positive way of, of a strong Christian family. And now you're working in a thoroughly secular environment. So Disney or otherwise, I want you from your experience to talk about how people working in a secular environment uh, can maintain their faith. How do you maintain your faith? And how can you let your light for Christ shine in an appropriate way? You have tons of experience with this, so tell us about it. It's not accidental. It's very deliberate. You have to want to be walking with God and you have to make, be making that choice and you must be in his word because as you, as he's with you and as you read the word, the things will come out. The Holy Spirit will, will speak at the right moment through you in, in different occasions. Um, I think in, in my case, um, I think the Lord led me to, uh, I shouldn't say twist my arm, but I don't mind if I say that because it was a good thing. He put me in a place where I had to study and read the Bible. I went to church one day and, and I was attending a Sabbath school class where there was this elderly lady that was teaching and I continued to come to that class. And this was in Burbank, California. After I started at Disney, I started attending church there in Burbank and uh, this lady would teach the Sabbath school and I think she was uh, happy to see this young person amongst everybody else there. And so she was drawn to that and invited me to her home with her husband to have lunch one day. And she popped a question that I never thought I'd hear from somebody. But she said, you know, I can't do this forever teaching Sabbath school. Would you be willing to teach lessons? And my first thought is, no, I don't know anything. I, I, how can I? You know, it's like, yes, you can. You read, you study, and then she said something to me that I'll, I'll never forget. You know, I'm going to jump in here. You know why I'm going to jump in? Yeah. We're going to take a break. Okay. And you want to know what that lady said that Hendel will never forget. 
The leading of God in a person's life to lead him to a place where he's crafting and impacting the minds and lives of young people. More on Conversations with Hendel Butoy in just a moment. Thank you for remembering that It Is Written exists because of the kindness of people just like you. To support this international life-changing ministry, please call us now at 800-253-3000. You can send your tax-deductible gift to the address on your screen, or you can visit us online at itiswritten.com. Thank you for your prayers and for your financial support. Our number again is 800-253-3000, or you can visit us online at itiswritten.com. In 1931, nine boys started out from Chattanooga, Tennessee in search of a new life. They made it as far as Scottsboro, Alabama, where they were accused of crimes they didn't commit and were sentenced to death. It was the Jim Crow era. If somebody said a black did it, a black didn't have a chance of even making it inside of a courtroom before he was hung on a tree. I don't know how they survived. In separate trials, guilty verdicts were returned, even though it was apparent to everyone looking on that the defendants were not guilty. In that miscarriage of justice, the civil rights era was born. Join It Is Written on location in Scottsboro, Alabama for the Scottsboro Nine. We'll look into the Bible and see what it says about justice, about false accusation, and about finding true freedom. The Scottsboro Nine, brought to you by It Is Written TV. Welcome back to Conversations. I'm John Bradshaw. My guest is Hendel Butoy. A moment ago, he mentioned that a lady in a Bible study class asked him a question. The context is this. I asked Hendel, who for many years worked as an animator at Disney, today is a professor at Southern Adventist University in Collegedale, Tennessee, where he teaches animation. I asked him how you work in a very secular company and still maintain your Christian experience? His answer is enlightening. So you said you you were very intentional about keeping close to God. You attended church. A lady asked you a question. What was that? Well, she asked me if I would take her class to lead in in these Bible studies. And um, I was hesitant, but she ended up by telling me, she said, I believe this will be the salvation of your soul. And for her to say something like that to me, very sincerely, um, it just hit me back a little bit. And, and, well, what is she saying? She's saying, I ought to get into the Word that I can tell others about it. And I couldn't say no at that point. There's nothing in me that, that could make me say no. So I, I, uh, I, I took her class little by little until she finally gave me the entire class. I ended up teaching every week, which means I had to be in the Word every week because I couldn't just stand there up there and talk about. And when I got in the Word, it began to change me, which the Word does. So that was all God's plan, was in order to change me, to, to uh, make my mind connected with His and see that He's worthwhile. Uh, that the things that I heard in the past, though I admired my parents and the way that they had walked, I had to experience it my own self in, in, a, in a real way. I had to get to know God myself. So do you think she was right? Was it the saving of your soul? I can't wait to meet her uh, because she's since passed on, but I can't wait to meet her in, in heaven and, and embrace her with, uh, with, with giving me that opportunity. Can't help thinking a young guy in Southern California has got his dream job. It's the, it's the, the center of the universe in terms of creativity and animation. There's a lot that could have drawn you away or distracted you distracted you from faith in God. So, so speak to the person right now who is working in a secular environment, and that's most everybody who works, unless you work for a church, working in a secular environment, what do you do, what do you think you need to do in order to preserve, not just maintain, but strengthen your faith in God while you work in this distracting environment? Three things come to my mind really quickly is what I just mentioned is walk with God, be in His Word, um, get to know Him in His Word, and listen to Him. The second one is pray and ask for the opportunities for when they come up. We, could, we would be sitting together as story artists, and, and, and something would come up in, in, a, in, in a story that would be just biblical or spiritual in nature. And somebody would ask a question about it, and I found myself in a position to answer something uh, regarding the Bible. Like somebody might say something regarding 
evolution. And then I could interject something about, well, did you think about it this way? You know, can it happen this way as well? So um, pray for those opportunities for where, where God opens up things for you. And what's the third one? It's when those moments happen where you see God leading, that you tuck those away in your back, in the back of your mind, so when he appears not to be there, you can remember them and say, I remember God led me here. I remember when he spoke through me in this occasion or that occasion. I remember how it touched this person's life here or there. And those re-inspire the inspiration that God is real, he's really there. This is a narrow question and a broad question. Are there fields that young people should just not work for, work in because of the, the content? Or are there some of these very secular fields, for instance, animation and these kinds of things today, are they just too secular? Or can people survive in those industries today? I think with anything that you go into, you need to do it prayerfully. You need to ask if God would have you there, if, if he has a purpose for you being there. And then if, if you sense a desire is tugging you in that direction, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I think God, God places that there for us as long as we put him first and we're seeking his guidance in it. When you find yourself there, continue to pray and to ask for his guidance um, because he will fulfill that purpose for, for bringing there. It, it is to influence, it's to touch other people in some way for Christ, whether it be with a word that helps them or that reminds them of things. Um, so let me ask you this. Let me ask you what, what you see, if any, other moral ethical implications of working for a company like Disney. There are people who will analyze Disney's content and they say, well, that's not even Christian. The, the, the mouse is a wizard, uh, in fact, and um, might look at some things that you find in there and storylines that they may uh, appear to be directly opposed to the principles of the gospel or teachings of the Bible. So how, did, did you have to reconcile that in your mind or, or how did you go about that or was it not a concern? Walk me through what you undoubtedly went through when you were considering your career. There were concerns as to what some of the things I might work on, if they would trouble me in terms of uh, contradicting my faith or my belief in things. Um, so I did have to make a choice and a determination. If something like that ever comes up, what am I going to do about it? Am I going to go ahead and work on it or, or not. Um, I did have a couple occasions where I had to say, this troubles me or bothers me. I can't see myself doing this and not knowing what the response was going to be. I know that on one project where I made that, um, uh, made that known, the director that I was talking to said, well, I'm not sure what, what to do with you then, you know, because here we're in the middle of a production and it's got to get done. And so I'm not sure uh, we'll have to, go talk to the uh, production manager or something. But I went and talked to the production manager and I found out that he himself was a Christian. And so I was fortunate in that regard that I was actually able to explain what it was that was troubling me. And he says, uh, well, I understand. We're going to try to find something else for you. That to me, but again, in my mind, I was ready to say, okay, if they're going to say, sorry, you can't, then I'm out of a job. And that's okay if that's what, if, if, that's, if this is the point where God is saying the doors are closed now, you've done the work here, now it's time to move on, I would be okay with that. And I think a person going into a secular situation like that needs to always have that attitude that if God is leading you there, he may also lead you away from it because there may come a time where he needs you somewhere else or, um, or you, you continue. So I was fortunate in those cases where they like me enough to want to put me on something else. Um, and so I would say that if a Christian finds themselves in that situation, speak up about it. Uh, let, your, let your conscience, the, well, the Holy Spirit is impressing you um, to, um, to speak out on it. You might be surprised at the reactions that you get. I imagine you've had to have conversations like this with, with students. As animation students, there's not a lot of a lot of demand for animation in the Christian world. I can't say there's none, but there's not an enormous amount. And the default options are what Pixar and Disney and DreamWorks and these kinds of things. So do you find that you that you need to speak with young people and help them to understand some of the temptations or challenges that they might face? 
Yes, one, one of the things that I really like to impress or try to impress on students here is the need to make God part of their artwork. The world will tell you that art is about self-expression. Um, but really, we ourselves are an expression of God. He's created in us in His image. And if His Spirit is working through us, then everything that we do becomes His expression. So artists are really intended to be God's expression through our hands as, as we're connected with Him. And in various ways, I like to try to get that message through to students. And, but you never know what, what makes it in and what doesn't. So it really is encouraging when I hear stories of students who leave here and go somewhere else and they work at, at a company uh, where we've had this happen, where a company has wanted to do something that they felt bothered their conscience in terms of the content. And, uh, and they spoke up about it. They, 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 they told them about it and the company, instead of firing them, changed the product. They, uh, they rejected the contract for the original product and got something else because they liked the students that much. So again, you might be surprised if you are walking with God and He's working with, with you and through you, the reactions that you might get when you speak up on things. Let me ask you this. So people will watch an old Disney cartoon or an old Disney film and they'll freeze frame it and say, look at that. And it might be something uh, unsavory or unfortunate. So what is it? You were on the inside. Is it because the Disney Corporation is intentionally putting images every 17 and a half minutes to corrupt people's morals? Or, or I have a suspicion as to how it might be. I'm interested in what you would say. Or, or how do those images that occasionally get in there, get in there? First of all, let me say there were things like that that did make it into those films. And you know, people have, have pointed them out. But they were, they were always done by uh, one individual here or there who wanted to do something as a gag or as, as a, you know, a practical joke in some way, and would kind of share it with their you know, buddies and, and there at the studio, oh, look what I did and, and all. There was nothing that was ever mandated on the artist. In fact, when that was discovered, when I was there, when things like that were discovered and people were starting to, to talk about it, um, the executives called the entire department and sat us down. They said, we don't want to see anything like this in our films. If we catch anybody doing this kind of thing, you're not going to last around here. So um, it, it was never a corporate thing. Now, but I will say, as a secular studio with secular mind and worldview of things, um, they don't know God. And so when you remove God from anything, something else takes its place. So instead of miracles, you'll have magic. Uh, in, instead of um, um, something that speaks to eternity, you have something that speaks to what we've evolved from. So something takes the place of God when you remove it. And in a secular environment where you don't have God, these things naturally come in. So as a Christian, you know this, you see it, and again, you have the opportunity when it arises to point some things out or to help influence, to guide this way or that way. You may not have all power to completely change something, but you may change somebody's life when you say something and it triggers something in their mind. Maybe down the future, they'll remember that and they'll want to look into it more and get introduced to God in some way. Young guy living in Burbank, working in Burbank, raised in Glendale. The weather's perfect. Life is good. You've got your dream job. It was your dream job. Yeah, it was. All right. Since I was 12, I wanted it. All right. Your dream job since childhood. And you are working at one of the best known and most beloved companies on the entire planet. Yea, verily, in the history of the planet. And you quit to move 3,000 miles and take a job teaching at a small Christian school. You've got to tell us what in the world you were thinking, and he will. He's Hendel Butoy, Professor of Animation at Southern Adventist University. We have more questions for him in a moment on Conversations. It was a tragedy of unspeakable proportions. Shockingly, suddenly, unexpectedly, shots were fired and people were left dead inside a church. 
How does a city respond to a crime of such hatred? How do individuals respond when people they love are snatched away by a madman's gun? Don't miss Radical Forgiveness. You'll meet pastor and author Anthony B. Thompson, who recounts his harrowing journey from loss to forgiveness. The love of God demonstrated in a remarkable way. Radical Forgiveness takes you inside a deeply personal tragedy and shows what God can do in a person's life. Don't miss Radical Forgiveness on It Is Written TV. Planning for your financial future is a vital aspect of Christian stewardship. For this reason, It Is Written is pleased to offer free planned giving and estate services. For information on how we can help you, please call 800-992-2219. Call today or visit our website, hislegacy.com. Call 800-992-2219. Today on Conversations, my guest is Hendel Butoy, a professor at Southern Adventist University in Collegedale, Tennessee, teaches animation. Hendel, you worked at Disney for a number of years, drawing. Animation didn't stay, it fell out of love with the pencil and uh, kind of fell for the computer. You, I imagine, had to transition through that. What was that like? It was great, but it wasn't easy because uh, the computer is a different machine. Actually, we like to talk about the computer as being a more expensive pencil because you still have to learn how to manipulate it, but it's manipulating something different than a pencil. So, um, Seems yeah. Seems to was, me like that'd be a bit like going from, going from drawing to sculpting almost. Is, is it that radical a change? Uh, to a degree, um, because it, it, when you're doing something 2D, you're having to think three-dimensionally but now you actually got the three dimensions that when you do something on one side, you have to make sure it's right on the other side as well and kind of turn it around. And then not only that, then it has to move properly in different, different angles also. So it, it, was, it was a bit of a, a challenge just learning the whole medium of, uh, of computer. Well, you survived the transition, but I'm, I'm wondering if there were artists who did not survive the transition. Well, there were. Uh, the artists that didn't survive the transition are basically the ones who never wanted to let go of their pencils. Um, the, the writing was on the wall that this was coming because uh, a, a picture had been made that was very, uh, a, a very well received and it was very well done. And so this was, the, this was the direction of things. But there were some artists who were saying, oh, we, we love our pencils and this is where we're going to stay. And, and the technology moved on without them. The jobs became less and less for pencil work and more for computer work. And those that hung on to their pencils were left behind, so to speak. So things have changed dramatically since you were a 12 year old wanting to become an animator one day. What do you see today? What are examples of animation today that make you say, wow, that's really well done? There's a lot of great animation being done today. It's, it's really pretty impressive. When, when I was a student and when I was just starting out, it was very few and far between very few places were doing it, uh, and it, it, they would just come out every once in a while. But it seems like today, the understanding of the principles and of storytelling, all these are important things that people are able to grasp it sooner because of the information age. The, this is all readily available to everybody and, and therefore do more with it. So there's a lot of really good animation out there in terms of how things move and how they tell stories. Um, I don't particularly like the content of everything that I see and would like to see things that have more eternal and spiritual based things under them. Um, but in terms of the quality and level of that, it's, it's pretty high now. You can go anywhere to find it. Now, my guess is you'd love to see more animation incorporated into Christianity and using that to tell the Christian story like you dreamed of when you were looking at the Uncle Arthur's books as a kid. So how does that happen? What's it going to take, or, or how can animators blend their talent, their professional talent, with their love for God? We don't see much of it. What's it going to take? How can it happen? Well, the love for God comes first. And if you've got that, your art is just an extension of that love for God. And you'll want to do anything that you can to express what God is, is, is 
is telling you. Um, animation is a very expensive art medium, even with the computers. When they first brought in computers into animation, they thought, oh, this is going to solve all our financial problems because it can be done just like that. And people still have this misconception that all you got to do with the computer is push a button and it does it for you. But the computer is not a human being, and therefore you have to tell it things that it doesn't know. And, uh, and so there's a whole learning process there in order to be able to, um, uh, to learn it. Therefore, it still requires a lot of people and a lot of time. And this is what makes animation expensive. And so to do something on a high quality feature type thing would take an enormous amount of investment and people to believe in it to make it happen. But artists and Christian artists can still do smaller projects that can still, in a, in, in a very short amount of time, still deliver powerful things. And there's samples that you can find with this that, that some Christians have done uh, online that you can see. And um, it's just, first of all, having that walk with God, having that experience with Him, and then wanting to share that. Because a Christian can't but share the good news. And so they look for ways to do it. So there you were in Southern California living the dream, living the dream. Uh, but today you, you're living in Eastern Tennessee, teaching animation at a Christian school. Uh, that was not the original vision. I think this question is really significant because there are a lot of people who, who achieve and experience terrific success uh, in their chosen field. They, they make it a long way on that professional road. Then they're called. They're called to ministry. They're called to teaching. It's a wrestling. So explain to me how that went on with you. And I want to hear how you managed to cross that bridge. You were able to, to look at Disney in the rear view mirror of your car and, and leave that all behind to teach. Yeah, many times I have students ask me the same question because that's where they're trying to get to. And they ask, you know, why'd you, why'd you leave all that? So before I ever got to Disney, while I was still at CalArts, I, um, I was praying and asking, Lord, would you have me in this, in this industry? And if you will, I'll continue to walk in it and please be with me. But if you don't want me in this industry, let me know. Close the door. Shut me out of something and I had that attitude before ever coming into Disney. And so when I actually got in, I felt as if God was leading, and I felt it was a privilege to be, for me to be there, and I couldn't take that for granted. And so I continued to make it a point and to keep that same attitude, Lord, at the end of every project, do you want me to continue? This was a constant prayer, a constant prayer I had at the end of every project. Um, one day a call came from some, for something different. Um, a dean of the school of, of here in, at, at uh, the School of Visual Art and Design, I don't know how he got my number because I don't give out, artists don't give their numbers out in the studio, in their offices, um, but somehow he found it and called me and said, we're an Adventist Christian school out here in Tennessee. We're just starting an animation program. Would you come out and just talk to the students? Just give a lecture of what it's like to be a Christian, an Adventist Christian, in a place like this, and uh, just they have that perspective. I said, sure, I'll come out just to do that, not thinking anything else about it. I'd been asked to do that kind of thing before, but never at a Christian college. And so I came out to Southern here and did that, and then they called me again the next year and would uh, nudge me a little bit more, like, is there, is there more that you can do for us? And I continued to get calls uh, until the question was finally popped. You know, would you consider we're just fresh, brand new starting, but we don't have any professional professors out here who are Adventist Christians. Would you consider coming out here and, and helping us out with that? I recognized that as something completely different. And I thought, well, here I've been praying all this time. Is it coming now? After talking with my wife and hearing that God was speaking to her also that this is a move we should make, we made that choice and we came out here. So what I tell my students when they ask me that question, how'd you get out here? Why, how did it happen? I say prayer. Prayer is the reason that I'm here. What do you enjoy about teaching? What I enjoy about teaching is that I get to see um, the influence of, of getting to know God with my students 
face to face, as opposed to doing something where an audience is going to see the work that I do, but I never get to really see them in a tangible way to know what kind of influence I'm having. With students, I can see tangibly what's going on. I enjoy that. So a kid is thinking, you know, I've got this idea. I would like to be an animator. Um, and there are only so many opportunities. I, I, I'm very spiritually inclined. I want to serve God. I'm not quite sure where the future is going. Speak to that, speak to that young person now. They're thinking of coming to Southern and doing arts or animation or, or something like that. How do, how do they weigh it up and make that decision if this is if, if there's a, a Christian future for them in this? First of all, put God first in everything and decide that if you're going to go down this route, that everything that you're going to do has him involved with it. And then seek to improve yourself in whatever that is. Uh, um, if it's drawing or if it's understanding movement, find ways to improve yourself on that. If Before you enter school, find ways to draw well or to uh, learn about the computer and moving things around and then get an education with it, but always do it with an attitude of asking God to lead you every step of the way. And be prepared that if God turns you a different direction that you'll be content with it because you know that it will be better than what you currently think is best. Um, because I thought I had the dream job, but I always felt like there was something still missing because I could not express my full faith in Christianity in there. I could to different individuals, but I could never put my, my faith into my work. And they were actually pretty animate about that at the studio. They didn't mind how you lived, and they were real, very supportive of you. I was, never had problems with the Sabbath or anything. But if I ever tried to put my faith into their work, then that's when the walls went up or, or the hand, you know, stop, we can't do that. Um, so you had to find uh, covert ways to do it which I did find a few of those. Um, so, and that's what I would say to the Christian going into something like this is you will find those moments and times where you can either touch as individuals, people that you work with, or the projects that you work on. As you walk with God, you'll find ways that you can say and do things that when people see it, they will respond and you'll go, wow, God is actually speaking to them the way that I was hoping he would, they, they actually responded. Well, thank you for sharing your story. Thank you for what you're doing to impact young people, point them in the direction of God and train them for a future where they can be especially useful in the work of God. It's been a joy, thanks for your time. And thank you. And thank you for your time. He is Hendel Butoy, professor at Southern Adventist University. I'm John Bradshaw, and this has been our conversation.